those simple components when you balance them properly, magic. Like straight magic. This is the story of Pad Kapow. All right, this isn't going to be a typical OTR video. I mean, there's no shocking twist or unexpected discovery, no accidental drive to Myanmar or mysterious vegan cult. Today, we're introducing a dish you probably already know. In fact, the odds are you know it so well that if you close your eyes, you can taste it. Like, try it, close your eyes. I bet you can imagine the texture of the pork or chicken, the heat from the chili, the sweetness from the oyster sauce and the sweet Thai soy, and the brightness from the holy basil. If you're really lucky you've had it with an egg on top, fried crispy on one side and almost raw on the other, the richness of the yolk combining with everything else and mixing with a bit of rice to make what might be the perfect bite. The old prime minister might have named Pad Thai the national dish, but if you ask anyone here, it's not even a question. It's Pad Kapow. It's served everywhere, from the back alleys to the busy streets, from worker cafeterias to Michelin restaurants. So where did this masterpiece come from? How did it spread? And in a city where every cook makes a version of Pad Kapow, is it possible for us to find the very best one. Oh, look at that. That is exactly how I like it. It's perfect. It's like, it's, you always have the contrast in flavors with the chili, the seasoning, the basil, the egg, but here because they, they really crisp up the pork. It was really crispy. It's like uh, the textural contrast as well as just, look at this. This is a perfect spoonful of food. Our quest to understand Pad Kapow starts here, at a place on Sukhumvit 23 called Ung Jia Huad, the name of the cook in Teochew Chinese. You wouldn't necessarily expect to find some of the best humble food in town at this address. I mean, this is right in the middle of luxury apartment towers and just a couple blocks away from Soy Cowboy. But before all of that was here, Mr. Ong was already making Pad Kapow in this spot, serving God knows how many plates of this legendary stuff since he opened his doors in 1972. Here, the secret is in the technique of deep frying the pork before stir frying to give it a crispy texture. Well, that and years and years of practice, bringing the freshest ingredients into a perfect balance. Pad Kapow with a fried egg has been called Thailand's burger and fries, a plate of stuff that just goes together like it was meant to be. Pad Kapow feels obvious, like something that's always been there, but this is actually one of the newest dishes we've ever covered on OTR, one of the newest creations you'll see on the average Thai restaurant menu. I mean, heck, it's not even that much older than Chef Ung himself. But when this does first show up in the historical record, it starts to appear almost everywhere, all at once. All right, we'll get the history stuff out of the way off the top since that part's not that hard. Since we don't know the date or place that this was first conceived, we can at least establish some parameters. The latest it might have come about was the 1940s, when Pad Kapow was said to be one of the dishes promoted in the years of Prime Minister Pibun Song Kram, Mr. Pad Thai, when he set out to build a sense of national identity. But it probably wasn't invented then, it was most likely already here. So in that case, the earliest possible date of conception would be around 1880, 
which is when Thai soy sauce was first invented, blending palm sugar with Chinese dark soy, and when oyster sauce was first bottled along the banks of the Pearl River in a town called Shajing, China. Those two ingredients, by the way, along with light soy sauce, together make up the primary seasoning elements of Pad Kapow. And when you also consider the technique of cooking a stir-fry in a wok, it's pretty obvious that this came from chefs with a Chinese background. But it's not a Chinese dish. I mean, this is as Thai as it gets. And the other ingredients, stuff like fresh red chili and the unique and incomparable herb called holy basil, those have been used in local cuisine here for centuries. More likely, it was made by Thai Chinese cooks in the early part of the 20th century for a very specific reason. But we'll get to that in a bit. First, we have just an absurd amount of Pad Kapow planned for the day. So let's keep eating. All right, so all over the city at lunchtime, you'll find places like this. And of course, out of all of this, on the very first page of the menu, Pad Kapow chicken, Pad Kapow pork, Pad Kapow seafood, Pad Kapow century egg, and those are four of the first six dishes that they list on the menu uh, out of a couple of hundred. This is what I guess you could call a Bangkok cafeteria. It's a jumble of street carts that all operate under the same roof and together combine into a restaurant that sells thousands of meals a day to the workers of downtown Sukhumvit. Here, this is about as close as we can get to the version of Pad Kapow most of Thailand eats as an everyday staple. Sorry, I should have let you film cutting into this egg. Again, just cooked perfectly. So basically, this is such a safe thing to order anywhere. It's really, really, really hard for a place that does this kind of volume not to do an amazing version of Pad Kapow. Pao. And uh, yeah, the Pad Kapow here is one of my favorites. And it's what I get whenever I come here. I'm going to guess that no matter where we go today, all of them are places I've been before. And all of them are places where I've had Pad to Pau because it's such a safe, everyday standby. And this is a, it's a beautiful version for about a dollar. Um, I am not the target audience of this restaurant. This is very much a uh, working class, grab a quick meal, go back to, go back to work. Mm. Maybe the thing that's most fascinating about this dish is that here, underneath the Prompong BTS station in a humble cafeteria, it's not that different from what you might find at restaurants right across the street in a luxury shopping mall jammed with Gucci and Prada stores. In fact, when the workers eating here finish their meals and walk out into the affluent neighborhood, the people passing in their Lamborghinis might very well have just had a plate of exactly the same thing. So that brings me to the second part of the backstory of Pad Kapow. And we can begin to pin down when exactly this came to be and why it was invented in the first place. Because the reason everyone loves this at lunchtime here is the same reason Americans of all stripes might grab a burger and fries. It's quick, dependable, and you know exactly what you're going to get. In other words, it's fast food. Now, the idea of fast meals on the go has an ancient history going back as far as the bread counters of ancient Rome, but it's really in the industrial era that this concept took off. The first fish and chips shop opened in London around 1860. Shawarma in its current form shows up in Turkey about a decade after that, and the first American fast food restaurant was actually an offshoot of a German concept created in 1896 called an Automat, where you'd actually buy your meal from a giant vending machine stocked by a kitchen hidden in the back. Pretty much everything created as fast food, like fish and chips and shawarma, the modern burger and pad kapow, came from chefs trying to figure out ways to package popular flavors in attractive ways that still allowed it to be sold cheap and made fast. Today, the concept of fast food gets a bad rap thanks to the dystopian spread of corporate chain serving processed slop molded into taco meat or chicken nuggets. But when this style of cooking first emerged, it was something kind of brilliant. It was like a Rubik's Cube for chefs and entrepreneurs all over the planet at the dawning of the age of industrialization. 
How can we make something that satisfies the local palate that's both affordable and, well, fast? How do we take the entirety of culinary history and package it as something scarfed down on a lunch break or brought home to feed a hungry family? Just like anything else, the first decades of the explosion of fast food were basically social Darwinism, survival of the fittest. There were a lot of bad ideas and a lot of dishes that didn't make it, eventually leaving only the most popular foods to survive until today. In Thailand, the real age of industrialization and the emergence of the category known as fast food started around 1910 and continued through the 1930s. This was the time period we've discussed at length on the channel before, when canals were replaced by roads and permanent structures were built inland. At the time, Chinese chefs dominated the category known as fast food, mainly for the reason that stuff cooked quickly in a wok in a category that would become known as Ahan Tamsang lends itself to exactly this type of service. But Chinese foods didn't necessarily have the kind of mass appeal here to really take over the market, so cooks combined local Thai dishes and endemic flavors with their own stir-frying techniques to win over a broad base of customers. And this is how we first find Pad Kapow, something intended as an elegant dish that just happened to be like the root of all fast food, fast, cheap, and showcasing the very best of local cuisine. Pad Kapow is one of my favorite things in the world, right? It's comfort food. It's, it has everything, really. You would want to Something's a bit comforting. It's meaty, it's like really nice and aromatic from the garlic, the shallots, the oyster sauce, the soy sauce if they choose the fish sauce, the basil or perilla or whatever herbs they may choose to use. Like, it's just one of those things you could just keep eating all day, right? Worked in Thailand for six years, mostly in Bangkok. I um, was working for Riley at Canvas, uh, One Star under David Thompson, Chef David Thompson and Chef Prin of oh, Kiki at uh, Nam. I was at Bolan very, very briefly as a stage. I had Tipling Club in Singapore, uh, Bacchanalia in Singapore, mostly start or 50 best places. Yeah, it's been a bit of a ride. To get a little deeper into the magic of Pad Kapow, I invited my friend Chin to join me at Boon Lang, the restaurant we featured before helmed by chef Kate Wang Santia, who happens to be Chin's former colleague at Canvas. I wanted to get a fine dining perspective on something most associated with street food. This is my test for cooks, right? You know, if you can bring this simple dish into balance, then I trust you to make anything, right? Because that's what this is. To me, this is something that's just a few components that really what it comes down to is can you make it taste as good as it can? I mean, would you, would you agree with that? Definitely. I mean, uh, something basic, right? But everything is built on the foundation of the basics. Whether you can season, whether you can make sure it's nicely cooked, not overcooked, not raw, your balance of your aromatics, your sauces, salt, sugar, and so on in this dish. If you can make a good krapao, you can probably make a good most thing. The balance in pad kapow comes down to the choice of ingredients, which means in a classic version of the dish, you can't make any substitutions without throwing everything else off. And this applies most of all to the most important part of any pad kapow, and that's the basil. We've talked about the modern history of Pad Kapow, but to really tell this story, we have to look at one ingredient in particular, the single component that above all else makes this dish what it is. Now, basil is something used to flavor dishes around the world. It's the backbone of pesto sauce and pizza margarita. It's added to holy water in churches in Greece and Serbia and Romania. It grows in gardens in American backyards and is added to pumpkin soup in West Africa. But you can't just use any basil to make pad kapow. The secret of this dish is an intense and regional variant known as holy basil. 
This specific plant is a unique and flavorful offshoot of the Lamiaceae family, a cousin to plants like mint, rosemary, sage, and lavender. It's called holy basil because it's venerated in the Hindu faith, a plant known to Hindus as Tulsi and associated with the gods Lakshmi and Hanuman. Holy basil probably originated in Northeast India, but it's been cultivated in Thailand and the surrounding countries for thousands of years. And even though it's widely unknown in the West, here the peppery flavor is a key component in some of the oldest Thai dishes. And it's this ingredient that elevates Pad Kapow from a simple stir fry to a masterpiece of flavor and balance. Uh, okay, so before we eat, I did want to ask you just from a chef's perspective, Thai basil, holy basil, Italian basil. Tell me the difference. In, in layman's terms, how would you explain the way the taste is different and why it's important classically, I guess, to use holy basil in the in a pack of pot? I find holy basil is a bit more anisey, a bit more a stronger, definitely stronger than the other two basils in terms of like the vegetal flavors, which is necessary for this dish because it's, it's so aggressively seasoned, right? You have your chilies, you have your meat, you have your oyster sauce, well, the soy sauce, fish sauce. You need something really strong to be able to stand up to it, especially if you're using like beef or something, something that's a meat that has a stronger flavor. Um, you can, I, I do know some people who use Thai basil in this dish, but normally for like chicken, because chicken's a bit more subtle. Now, holy basil by itself doesn't make something iconic, I mean, it has a unique flavor that matches the other components in a classic pad kapow. But when you change one of those other components, you have to adjust everything else in the formula to keep that balance. Chef Kate made us two dishes showing off the subtlety of the ingredients and demonstrating how everything in a kapow dish has to stay in harmony. The first is a seafood kapow, subtle and delicate with just the minimum of seasoning to bring out the freshness of the ingredients. This one uses the classic holy basil. And then there's this, pad kapow made with beef, which uses dried chilies to add a depth of flavor, and doesn't use what we call basil at all, instead substituting perilla leaves. Like, I've never had kapow with perilla before, right? Oh, yeah? But I'm hearing you say that the word, the Thai word for per perilla also mm -hmm. is a variety of kapow. Yeah. Uh -huh. I'm thinking about it, it actually makes so much sense. Like, like we, we've worked together and mm -hmm. we've done perilla pairings with meat before yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh -huh. i've never thought of i've never thought of this like just swapping out the herbs uh -huh. like it's always just been crap out, crap out, yeah crap out. and you can try you can try the first leaf this is kind of different side by side with the normal kapow this is of what type people we take the perilla leaf as a big brother of kapow yeah that is sweet it's minty yes super aromatic exactly which is like to cover the, the, the beef smell or whatever like that. It just like get and, rid of that. And it finishes slightly umami and slightly mm. bitter as well. Yeah. I, and but once when it's cooked, it's turned to a little bit sourness in there. Yeah, as you can get from here, from the kapow. Yeah. Brings back a lot of memories, this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> This part of power for me is just like simple, normal, but like like you said, it's not everyone can make the good part of power, which is like sometimes you, they just like burn the chili or whatever like that, overcooked meat, a little bit like too watery, too dry or whatever like that. It just depends on the version. But that's a very personal thing, right? It's mm -hmm. like everyone likes their part of power that's a bit yeah. different. Some people like it a bit drier, some people like it a bit saucier. Yeah, some people like come to me and then order part of power like can I have pad kapow without chili? Just only garlic, protein. <laughs> yeah, garlic, protein, and basil leaf. That's it. Yeah, it's yeah. Like you said, it's, it's quite personal. I am addicted, and I find chilies and anything spicy irresistible. Excuse me, whilst I struggle. Struggle to speak. Oh man. This plate is extremely spicy. It's spicy. <laughs> the spiciest thing I've ever, I've ever tried. 
it just gets hotter and hotter <laughs> and hotter. Well, f balance. This is a restaurant called Ped Mark, and as you can probably guess, it's a place co-owned by Mark Weens, and it's known for a blindingly spicy Pad Kapow. In fact, Pad Kapow is the only thing sold here. A few different variations of the dish serve with a homemade blend of chili peppers and a promise to wreck the rest of your day. So here it is, the spiciest palate-busting plate of Pad Kapow at Ped Mark. It's a slow burning heat. All right, I am getting some of the heat from the uh, Kapalmo. Okay, it comes at you, but it's not. Okay. I've had Kapalmo where you have it stop. But I just can't. I can keep But do you want to? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Ped Mark might not be the best example of a perfect Pad Kapow. It's more like an amusement park ride. But it's worth mentioning that we also tried a more moderately seasoned Wagyu beef version, which was nicely cooked, and anyway, the point is that this is the fun of Pad Kapow. It's such a delicate balance in ingredients that chefs can treat it like an artist's palate. Add a little extra oyster sauce for a sweeter, more umami version. Crisp up the meat to give it a textural contrast. Blast the f out of your customers by throwing in just an insane amount of chilies. And all across Bangkok, you can find chefs elevating Pad Kapow or adapting it to fit their own ingredients. Two of my favorite versions come from completely opposite ends of the culinary spectrum, but they're both still amazing in their own way, and just like Mark Weens makes his dish intended for thrill seekers, these are both tailored to their unique customer bases. There's May Veggie House, a restaurant in Asok specializing in Thai classics but made entirely vegan. And their Pad Kapow using bean curd instead of pork or chicken is actually, and you're going to have to trust me, one of my favorite versions of the dish. And not far away in the downtown neighborhood of Tonglor, there's the Michelin-rated Supanaga Eating Room, one of the absolute best places in town, and maybe my favorite of their dishes is their Pad Kapow with crispy fried basil and a golden century egg. And that's not their only elevated Kapow dish. They also serve a Kapow with hand-harvested mushrooms that's just sensational. Pad Kapow is one of the world's great dishes, and as we'd gone through the city from working-class lunch counters to Michelin restaurants and everything in between, we'd tried not just the classic version, that masterpiece of perfect balance between big and bold flavors, but variations made by some of Thailand's best and most exciting chefs that showcase all kinds of different elements while maintaining the soul of Pad Kapow. But in the time we've been doing this channel, out of all the legendary and iconic places we've been, there's one cook whose mastery over the walk stands out above the others. And so, for our final taste of Pad Kapow, we came back to the narrow alleys of Klongdoi Slum, somewhere that for us, like that old show Cheers, is a place where everybody still seems to know our name, where friends we made while filming have become friends for life, and where Chef Ga is still behind his humble counter making some of the best food anywhere. Of course, one of his most popular dishes is Pad Kapow, and of course he has his own genius twist on it, mixing his minced pork with a homemade teriyaki sauce 
and topping it all with an egg cooked into an omelet. We knew since we started filming that our plan was always to end up here. And while Pad Kapow is something that appeals to everyone and has inspired chefs who cater to all segments of the local population, at its core, this is a dish for everybody. Something meant to appeal to the masses. And in the alley at the center of the Klongdoi slum, Pad Kapow is the signature dish of the everyday lunch hour. But by dinner time, those walk ladies are back home and we figured who better to serve a catered dinner of literally everything we'd eaten all day than the guys from the neighborhood. So at each place we visited, from Master Ung to Sukhumvit's favorite, from Mark Wiens to Chef Kate of Boon Lang and the Michelin-rated Supanaga, from the vegan specialty of May Veggie House to the walk of Chef Ga, we bought an extra portion to go. And now it was time for the real experts to give it all a taste test and to see how these versions stand up to the highest of scrutiny. In the end, it doesn't really matter, but if you're curious, the overwhelming favorite was Kate's Seafood Kapow, with a tie for second between Supanaga's crispy basil version and the teriyaki pork from Chef Ga just a few meters away. But everyone, every single person, said that ultimately, if they had to eat one of these versions every single day, well, they'd probably stick with the classic, that genius combination of ground pork holy basil, garlic, oyster sauce, light soy and sweet black soy, sugar and fresh chili peppers, served with a runny egg over rice to make something that just might be a perfect dish. Subscribe to the channel for more from OTR. Thank you so much to everyone who supports us on Patreon. It means a lot and we're doing our best to get as much bonus content as we can produce online for our patrons. For all social media, please check the links below. We'll see you next week.